Viva Puerto Rico! Thank you so much for being with us today. I remain Eddie Torres, President and CEO of Grant Makers in the Arts. I am so happy to see you all here. Wanted to go ahead and start off with just a couple of opening remarks about the Supreme Court ruling barring affirmative action uh, as a consideration in university admissions. Now, just to get this out of the way, please know the Supreme Court ruling is very narrow. If you're not running a university, this does not affect you. Now, it and efforts like it are meant to scare you into freezing. Don't do their work for them. You do not need to freeze. Now, as I've mentioned before, our friends at the identity-based affinity organizations, for instance, APFI, a philanthropic partnership for black communities, Asian American Pacific Islanders in philanthropy, Native Americans in philanthropy, Hispanics in philanthropy, and others are working toward an approach to which we can all contribute and refer our colleagues. Now, I'm gonna put this all in writing. You're gonna get it in, uh, well, once we're back from the, the conference. Uh, so you don't have to take notes furiously. But I just want to give you an overview. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law has initiated the Protecting and Advancing DEI Pro Bono Initiative. The initiative was created to provide legal advice to organizations concerned about their ongoing or future efforts to support equity. And I'll send you a link to it. Our friends at the identity-based affinity organizations are also engaging foundations in conversations about setting up a fund to support legal representation for small foundations and for grantees uh, to provide uh, uh, literally legal representation in litigation. This is a funding opportunity, and for those of you who are interested, you can contact our friends at APTV. I'll give you a, a contact in the, the written piece when we get back to New York. Now, as regards communications, our friends at Native Americans in Philanthropy and uh, other organizations are currently interviewing communications firms. The goal is to flood the sector with information on what they can do and the need for doing more in this moment rather than less. This is a funding opportunity. And our friends at APFI continue to compile resources on their website about this situation and situations like it and how you can address them. For those of you who have information that you want to share, you can share that with our friends at APFI, uh, with Bonami Johnson Sr., the Director of Special Initiatives at APFI, and I'll share, I'll share their email. Now, you're gonna get all of this in writing. The most important thing to hold in your hearts is this. Our goal is not survival. Our goal is glorious, triumph. This and efforts like this, the opposition to affirmative action, but also things like the banning of books, did not emerge from communities. They emerged from politicians. Politicians have been trying to end affirmative action since it became part of the law in the 1960s. And it took this long because it wasn't popular to end it. The general public weren't opposed to it. It took decades of trying to change the narrative, replacing the idea of affirmative action with terms like quotas and reverse racism, stoking emotional responses even when they flew in the face of actual facts. And again, this has taken decades. And this work, narrative change, education, professional development, these things aren't free. Conservative donors and foundations began giving multi-year general operating support to these efforts using a generational time horizon for success. Again, this is work that started in the late 1960s and it took generations to get us to this point now. It is only by doing the same that we will achieve the only goal that is worthy of the communities we seek to serve. And that goal is glorious triumph. We must embrace our power and support power building. We have to embrace the power of culture to
to change the world. The present, at times, will feel like it belongs to the right. But the future is ours. People of color, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, people with disabilities will triumph. And we will all be better off because of it. It'll only happen if we keep glorious triumph in our hearts as our goal. It's in that spirit that I am grateful to introduce a member of the conference planning committee, Senior Program Officer, Thriving Cultures at the Cerdna Foundation, Robert Smith III. So that's an extraordinarily difficult act to follow, but I just want to hold in our minds um, glorious triumph. Um, and I also wanted to hold in our minds um, this word truth teller. So I would love for everyone in the room, you know, keep your eyes open or close them and imagine someone in your life that could be an ancestor, um, a friend, a colleague, um, someone who's a truth teller to you. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. Do you have our truth tellers in mind? Yeah? I can't see you, so I have to hear you. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Um, so, so with that in mind, with our truth tellers in our minds and in our hearts, I'm really um, honored to introduce to, um, to all of you um, tonight's truth teller, Vule. So Vule writes the blog, nonprofitaf.com nonprofitaf.com <laughs> he's the founder and former executive director of rvc a leadership and capacity building organization focused on supporting leaders and organizations of color vu's passion to make the world better combined with a low score on the law school admission test <laughs> drove him into the field of nonprofit work. <laughs> I practice not laughing at this, but it's just so good. Where he learned that we should take the work seriously, but not ourselves. There's tons of humor in the nonprofit world, and someone needs to document it. He is going to do that, with the hope that one day a TV producer will see how cool and interesting our field is and make a show about nonprofit work, <laughs> featuring attractive actors attending strategic planning meetings <laughs> and filing 990 tax forms. <laughs> <laughs> um, known for his no BS approach, irreverent sense of humor, and love of unicorns, Vu has been featured in dozens, if not hundreds, of his own blog posts. <laughs> at nonprofitaf.com. <laughs> Everyone, let's welcome Vule. Thank you, Robert. That was probably the best reading of my bio I have ever heard. <laughs> Thank you, GIA, for inviting me uh, to come speak this year. And not next year, when you'll be in Chicago <laughs> in November. <laughs> Um, I do feel like I'm crashing, like whenever I'm in a, a room full of funders, I feel like I'm crashing the party a little bit. And what I normally do is I try to steal as many things as I can, like all the swag before I get kicked out, right? Um, it also doesn't help that I don't have my badge still. Eddie, I still don't have my badge. I, and the last time that this happened um, in, uh, at, in LA uh, a few weeks ago, I was denied entry into a session, right? And I was like, do you know who I am? <laughs> and they said, we have no idea who you are. And I said, that's OK. With enough therapy, maybe I can figure it out on my own. I don't know. Um, anyway, I'm glad to be here. It's been so great. I got in yesterday and attended a few sessions. I was there at the reception and the keynote this, uh, in the, this afternoon. And I've just been so inspired by you all. So thank you so much for having me here. 
nonprofit philanthropy and the arts, why we are so awesome and how we can be even more awesomer. By the way, I wrote this when I was on the plane, very jet lagged, so this is why. And I'm also trying to be more optimistic. It's been very rough. Here was the original title of this keynote. <laughs> Funding the arts, nothing's gonna change. It's just hopeless, hopeless, everyone. Okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna try to be more optimistic today, okay? We're gonna talk about how we're gonna be more awesome. All right? So stuff we'll talk about today, we'll talk about how, how awesome you all are, some of the things that we're dealing with that we need to change a bit, and, that's, and then just we'll end with more of how awesome you are. That's, that's the whole thing today, okay? And I'll be throwing in random metaphors about Marvel and I don't know, whatever, I don't know. I'm still jet lagged. Um, a few disclaimers before I get started. One is that I have small children. I like, well, I guess, I mean, one is 10 and one is seven. And some of you may know this, but having a baby is like getting a multi-year federal grant. <laughs> At first you're like, yay! <laughs> and then you're like, oh, this is so much work. And the requirements change every year. And <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I don't know, I haven't slept in 10 years and Robert's gonna come on up and we're gonna talk at, at the end. So if I forget to say something, please feel free to, to ask me in Q&A. Uh, disclaimer number two is that I don't claim to speak for anyone except myself, right? I've run a non several, two nonprofits, I've been a fundraiser, and, but that doesn't make me an expert in anything. This is just one dude's opinion, right? And you can feel free to disagree, right? This is just, you, you know, it's easy to say, oh, Vu, he's on stage, he must represent all people of color, or all attractive vegans everywhere, <laughs> or whatever, right? One dude's opinion, okay? Um, I may say some things that could upset people. Like one time people were like, Boo, can you not say the F word? You, uh, the F word? Like fascism, can you not? <laughs> Look, this is what we're fighting, y'all, okay? So if it upsets you when I call out white supremacy or something, like, I hope that you just lean in into it. You don't have to agree with anything that I'm saying, right? And the last disclaimer is that there will be pictures of baby animals on every single slide for no reason <laughs> whatsoever. It's just that Japanese researchers discovered looking at pictures of baby animals increases your productivity. They were really good grant writers. They got a, a grant to study this. <laughs> okay, the baby animals have nothing to do with anything, um, and they're all adorable, and except for one, it's adorable, and it will kill you. You gotta figure out which one it is, okay? All right. Why you are so awesome? I just wanna just talk about how fantastic you all are before I start reading you for filth uh, today. <laughs> so, you're amazing. I, I love the arts, and I, I feel like I owe my career to the arts, because I came in as an ESL student who didn't speak any English at all from Vietnam when I was eight years old. And school was awful. I had this horrible haircut from my dad, who's like a, a brilliant human being, but he's a, a terrible haircutter. And so I was getting bullied all the time. I didn't understand anything. And it was the arts that kept me in school. I joined this chorus, and I didn't understand what I was singing, but I just felt like I belonged to this community. And then later on, I discovered that I was actually pretty good at visual art. Um, and we were doing this activity in the, in the fifth grade where we were just making these snowflakes, like construction paper snowflakes with tissue paper, like black construction and tissue paper. And I made the best snowflake ever, okay? And it was hung up on the window. And every day I, I would look at that snowflake and I was reminded that I, that I love school and I love learning and I wanted to come to it. So the art has been a really important part of my, my life. Um, I told my dad I wanted to be an artist and he was like, you're gonna starve and so don't. Uh, so I got, I didn't wanna starve so I got into social work. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that you all are amazing, and the past couple of days I've just been learning about just all the cool things that you are doing, and it is incredible. And I, I do feel like our sex is like food and air. No one appreciates air. You know, like people can see food, so they call themselves foodies, they take pictures of food. But no one really sees air, and so they don't appreciate air. And so the work that you all do is oftentimes invisible. Yeah, the art could be there the murals and everything, but like all the work that it takes to get that art there is often invisible, and no one appreciates it. That's why we don't have many shows about nonprofit work. There's like 19 shows about baking. There's barely any shows about nonprofit work. 
I want to work on some shows about nonprofit work, like for example, dancing with major donors. <laughs> okay. Oh. You know, or like nonprofit and afraid, where we take someone <laughs> we take someone who's never worked in nonprofit before and we place them at like a homeless shelter, you know, and they get a survival item and it's like a 1993 Honda Accord. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking we also have like nonprofit the musical. I'm thinking of cool characters we could have, for example, a consulting robot. It's a robot that's also a consultant, and it says exactly what the staff says, but the board listens to it. <laughs> and a development director character, but it's played by a new actor in every scene. <laughs> and no one talks about it throughout the entire musical, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, talk to me later if you want to work on the, on the musical, okay? The last few years have been really awful, y'all, okay? And I know it's been really hard for the arts uh, sector. And I, I, I talked to my arts friends, and they're like, Vu, one of them literally said, Vu, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm, like, is my work even important? Because right now, all the basic needs, food banks and all this stuff, I just feel like they need more resources. I'm like, yes, it is so important. The arts are so important. Do you know where we'd all be if we didn't have like Netflix and shows to watch and books to read and stuff? The arts are so critical right now. And I know it's been really rough because a lot of arts organizations have done everything right in our sector. They were earning like revenues by selling tickets and all this stuff. And that was what was like costing them so much during the pandemic. So it just doesn't feel very fair. Um, we're facing this sort of necessary existential crisis right now in our sector. Like everyone, not just arts, but everyone in the entire sector is. And I think it's a good one. I call it a necessary existential crisis because for so long we've been putting up with so much crap in our sector. And in this moment, we have to resist the pull to go back to that sort of crap that we've been just okay with. Right? Like overhead and stuff like that. Like I just, we just don't have time for that anymore. Overhead. What, what, what is that? Like why? I think many of us are like firefighters trying to put out the fires of injustice and every three or four steps one of you funders or donors like, uh, I want to make sure that the money I'm giving you is um, being spent on the water and not the hose. <laughs> what is your hose to water ratio? You know, like, who, who has time for that anymore? So we're, we're going to move beyond this now, all right? We're fighting Thanos, y'all. All the stuff that Eddie listed, you know, like all the, the attacks on the rights, the attacks on abortions, the, all of it, it's, it's awful. Everything that's happening in the Middle East right now, like the genocide that's happening in Gaza, it's like we... We have to be vocal and we have to do things better because we're fighting this force and I feel like in some ways Thanos has won. Like he has snapped half the universe out of existence. This is what it's been feeling like. You know, and we have to, we have to assemble because we are Avengers. We gotta assemble to fight Thanos now. We gotta fight Thanos with everything that we got. And unfortunately, this is what has been happening. Right, this is how we've been fighting Thanos. Iron Man is like, uh, I'm only gonna give up 5% of my resources to fight Thanos <laughs> because I'm saving 95% of my endowment to fight future Thanoses. <laughs> <laughs> and Captain Marvel is like, I know what we should do to fight Thanos. We should form a think tank <laughs> that will spend the next two years studying who will be most likely to be killed by Thanos. And then we will write a white paper on who will be like, most likely to be affected by Thanos. And, and then, you know, two years later, they're like, guess what, everyone? We spent two years trying to find out who will be most likely to be affected by Thanos. And we discovered it is women of color and disabled people and trans people. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. We never knew that information. <laughs> Let's put on a summit now.
And then Doctor Strange is like, um, it seems very political to say that we're fighting Thanos. And also, you know, like, can we just like talk to Thanos and be a little civil to Thanos? And you know, and maybe Thanos has a good perspective. We need pluralism <laughs> in perspective. Okay, this is this is this is us as the Avengers right now, and we gotta figure out like, is this where we want to be? We we can't we can't be there anymore. Okay, we become this white moderate sector. The white moderate is what Dr. King called you know like what, all these well-meaning people, and from his letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote, he wrote that this is this is basically the biggest threat to justice, are not the people burning crosses, you know, and 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 wearing hoods and stuff. It's like like the white model, the well-meaning people standing on the side saying, you know what, I really, I believe in equity and justice, but can we go a little slower? Can we be nicer? Can we, can we try this? You know, can we wait it out for a more practical time? Our entire sector and philanthropy has become this giant white moderate that Dr. King is talking about. <clears throat> and our communities cannot afford for us to be there anymore. We gotta do things differently. We gotta move towards the future now. And so here are a few things we gotta do. We gotta own our power and awesomeness. We are the third largest sector. We are 10% of the workforce in the United States. We contribute 900 billion to the economy every year. We are 6% of GDP, right? And so many of us are still so humble about everything. And I think we can't keep becoming air anymore. We can't remain air. We, gotta just, we just gotta be in people's faces a lot more. We gotta own this power here, okay? because it's been affecting us. We get into this scarcity and martyrdom, S&M mindset, <laughs> where we don't invest in our staff. You know, people don't know what they're gonna do for retirement. I think I'm gonna have to exotic marigold hotel some shit to like retire <laughs> later. So, you know, stop being so humble. We gotta embrace an unflinching look at the past and how it shapes the present. Like I, I am, like we've been avoiding it. We don't talk about the root causes or the roots of philanthropy or where wealth comes from. Wealth, a lot of wealth in this country comes from five things. Slavery, stolen indigenous land, <laughs> worker exploitation, environmental degradation, and tax avoidance. <laughs> and our sector becomes like this, like giant sky mall catalog <laughs> for the rich, mostly white donors are like pick and choose from. They're like, oh, this is great. I love this cause. Oh, this cause is even cheaper. Or this cause has lower overhead or whatever. We become a giant sky mall catalog, y'all. Okay, and we don't stop to think about like, okay, like what do we actually need to do? We need to talk to our donors about reparation. <laughs> <laughs> Funders need to talk about, you know, maybe returning some stolen indigenous land. We have to embrace the past here. We're gonna move into the future. We gotta have the courage of imagination and the audacity of ambition. I feel like in some ways, we've lost our imagination. And this is why the arts is so important because the arts is about imagining things, right? It's so great, but like, I feel like the last several years, we've lost our imagination a little bit, many of us, because of everything that's been happening. Like, I see all these arguments online. You know, like, like I was like, we need to defund the police. And they're like, oh, I don't know about that. Like that. Uh. What happened? Like, we're in this dystopian society. I was looking at the Baltimore City budget. Who's from Baltimore? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Baltimore. Yeah, your police budget is like 10 times more of education and civics and housing, everything combined. Like, that's dystopian. It's the same in Seattle. So then when we say, let's defund the police, people are like, oh, I don't know. Like, where's the imagination? So many of the things that we've been working for, marriage equality and stuff, are things that people could not imagine in the past. We have to get our imagination back. And we have to have the audacity of ambition. Who knows about Juicero? Juicero? Okay, I can't say any of you, so never mind. Juicero <laughs> was a Wi-Fi connected juicing machine that came out of Silicon Valley. Think about this, a Wi-Fi connected juicing machine. It was $700. You buy these proprietary packets of cut up fruit and vegetables for $8 each. You place one packet in, into this machine and it squeezes out one glass 
of juice. <laughs> Bloomberg did an investigation and discovered that you can take the packets, squeeze them by hand, <laughs> and get almost the same amount of juice, but faster. <laughs> so they wrote about this. And Juicero immediately went bankrupt. But before it did, it was boasting that it had $125 million in venture capital. That it had like 40 full-time engineers working to design this Wi-Fi connected juicing machine. Meanwhile, some of us are like, can we please get $19 to end racism? <laughs> and some of y'all funders are like, um, we'll give you $2? that you only spend on paper clips on Tuesdays, right? Because we don't fund 100% of any project. And then we're like, why, why aren't things working? What, what is going on? OK, we've got to have the audacity of ambition. We've got to, you've, got to, you've got to encourage your grantees to have the audacity of ambition. We've got to get over archaic bullshit funding fundraising practices. <laughs> this could be the entire presentation, because I'm, you know, <laughs> I have high blood pressure issues, and I'm taking, so I'm going to try to calm down a little bit. But there's like so much bullshit in fundraising. Like one year grants. That's bullshit. Like, what, what are you, you're forcing nonprofits to play funding hot potatoes from one year to another and just spending all their time fundraising. The 5% payout rate, like, what are we saving for when it is pouring on our communities right now? We're saving for a rainy day, it's pouring. There's a monsoon right now. All this hoarding. Is unacceptable. We're saving for a future that will not exist for anyone except wealthy white men in the future. And restricted funding, what is that? If you are still giving out restricted funding, you are basically the climate changing, uh, the climate change denying anti vaxxers of our sector, okay? Because. <laughs> We just, we just don't have time for this. Give multi-year general operating dollars. My God, let's, let's move on, OK? There's just so much. And I, I just find the entire idea of grant applications to be so ridiculous. Every organization should just have one grant application. That's it. No tailoring for anyone. <laughs> yes, you can clap. But think about this. I mean, we've just been thinking that this is completely normal to have organizations and artists apply for grants. Can you imagine a food pantry operating the way that philanthropy does? Can you imagine like, like a food pantry going out and saying, hey, hungry families, we know that you're very hungry, but we're only giving out 5% of our food. <laughs> we're saving 95% for future famines. <laughs> so to make it fair and objective, what we're going to do is ask each of you to write an essay about how hungry you and your families are and to develop a logic model about what this, these cans of beets that we give you is going to do, is, is going to help your, your kids graduate from college. Like, what? We need to know this. And then we'll give food to the families that wrote the best essays. That's bullshit. H how is that even acceptable? It should be the responsibility of the food pantries to find the families that are most affected by food insecurity and ensure that they get the resources that they need. And it should be the same for philanthropy. It should be funders' jobs to find the communities that are most affected by systemic injustice and ensuring that they get the resources that they need. I don't know, the whole thing, like this whole culture of philanthropy, I can't stand it. It's not a culture of philanthropy. It is a culture of fundraising. It is a culture of ensuring that, that we keep kissing up to rich, mostly wealth, wealthy white donors. That's the entire culture that we've been perpetuating. It, that's not philanthropy. That's fundraising. And there's so much BS in fundraising, too. So anyone who's a fundraiser in this room, we have to get out of our mind of like all these mindsets that we've had regarding fundraising. Like, I'm very tired of it. I'm tired of the way we've been trained to fundraise. Like, like make sure that donors feel like heroes. Make sure you use the word you 20 times in every appeal letter. You, you did it. Because of you, we were able to support five artists or whatever. You know? It's exhausting. And I kind of liken it to, I don't know, 
this sort of donor-centered fundraising to husband-centered marriages. <laughs> right, but look, look, I, I have been a husband until recently. <laughs> and I would have loved it if my partner sends me a handwritten thank you note every time I did the dishes, right? <laughs> Right, just look like at Henry and thank you note. Dear Vu, you did it. <laughs> because you washed the dishes today, our family is stronger. <laughs> our community is better because of you. The children and I are so thankful for your presence in our family. Please attend this exclusive wine and cheese event. <laughs> for amazing donors like you. Like, the fuck, what, why? Like this is, like, that is not, like that's, we think that's completely normal. Like how is, how is that normal? That cannot be a good relationship, right? In, a, in an equal relationship, like I should just do the chores because that's, I live in this relationship. I just do it without being thanked, without being asked. And you know, we should be mutually appreciative of one another, but one person should not be constantly chasing after the other one, thanking them, making them feel like a hero all the time. We got shit to do. We got to intellectualize less, and we got to mobilize and act more. Our sector <laughs> loves this. You know, loves it. We think that if we're just intellectualizing, we're just thinking and writing white papers and putting sticky dots on walls or whatever, that we're doing stuff. In Seattle, for a long time, there was this whole community engagement thing. Everyone was just doing community engagement. Remember that? Community engagement? I always joke that if you're in Seattle and you're walking down a dark alley at night and you feel like someone's following you, it's probably someone trying to do some community engagement. <laughs> you know? And they're like, Psst, hey, buddy, come to this equity summit about this white paper and we'll give you some sticky dots and you can vote on priorities. You can put all your sticky dots in one priority if you want or you can spread them around. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> like, this is, no, like, we gotta start acting, y'all. That's why I just love our lunchtime keynote speaker, like all the action and the mobilizing. That's what we need to be doing. I love Jan Masaoka from Cal Nonprofit who said that we've become so professionalized that we can do logic models and theories of change and whatever, and we can't get like 100 people to City Hall. <laughs> That's what we need to be doing. We gotta be doing more of that, okay? What is this? Oh, have the courage to be unfair. Hey, we've been caught up in this very white model of fairness. Like everything needs to be fair. And like funding needs to be divided equally. People need to be, have this a bit opportunity to compete for funding because it's like fair. Like, how do we level the playing field? The playing field will never be level, ever. There is no leveling of playing field. The playing field is based on white supremacy and patriarchy and everything. It will never be level. What we need to do is create an entirely new field. So if that means that you care about missing and murdered indigenous women, then you ensure that funding is going to indigenous communities. If you care about black communities, you ensure that funding is going to black communities. This is what we should be doing, not force everyone to compete in this hunger games and then hope that maybe some of the communities that are most affected by systemic injustice would be able to wipe the grants well enough and say the right things on site visits to get the funding. We gotta reimagine the roles of funders, boards, leaders here. Many of y'all have been stuck in this role where you're basically like micromanagers trying to figure out like if these nonprofits are not doing things right or if they're not. It's an awful way to, it's, it's, it doesn't seem fun to me at all. <laughs> I remember when I was running an after school program, you know, we did lots of arts and, and photography and writing all this stuff for kids who just arrived to the United States. And I remember one, one time in March, all the kids started skipping like half of them were just gone from the program. And the first person I thought about calling was our major donor, our biggest donor, Muriel from the city of Seattle. 
So I slumped against the wall and I, and I called her up. I was like, Muriel, like, the kids are not coming to my program. It's awful. I'm a horrible, garbage human being. Our program is terrible. Like, do you want your money back? Like, what is going on? <laughs> I wasn't very confident back then. Um, <laughs> and Muriel said, Vu, calm down. You're doing great. It's just that it's spring in Seattle. There's only eight days of sunshine in the year. <laughs> Kathy knows about it. Right. And so all the kids are skipping every single program across the city right now. Okay, and you're fine, just add some outdoor activities and the kids will come back. And that's what we did, and they came back. But I love the fact that that was the first person I thought about calling, was Muriel, right? Be a Muriel. <laughs> Move the lever, levers of power that affects every issue we care about. And, you know, we've been so siloed. I think I, I, I appreciate what Althea Erickson was saying in the session I crashed yesterday, which is like art seems to be like its own like thing, kind of walled off, and yet also underfunding itself, <laughs> right? And, and I think in some ways, we, all of us in this sector have been like, we've been siloed, right? We're working on our own things, but we really need to start working on these levers of power that will affect every single issue that we all care about. And for me, those levers are, one, we gotta elect more progressive women of color into every single office. We gotta protect voting rights, y'all. Protect and advance voting rights. There's been like 500 bills suppressing votes across the sector, across the states, and our sector's response has been, meh, that's like mission creep, you know? We got, we all, it's not mission creep to work on voting rights. Every one of us should be working on voting rights. And we've got to change the tax code so that rich people are paying their fair share of taxes. And maybe many of us can be put out of business and we become like a wedding singer like we've always dreamed about, you know? <laughs> we've got to engage with politics, y'all. We do. Okay. I think our sector has always been like, oh, I don't know, that's, that's too much politics. We've got to be above the fray. We've got to jump into the fray immediately. That's what, that's, we gotta do that. And we gotta burn a few bridges. <laughs> burn them. Burn these bridges. Like, we gotta stop being so afraid to offend people. Like, our sex is full of really nice, caring people. We don't wanna offend, we're conflict of avoidance. We don't wanna offend anyone. But you know, we gotta burn some bridges and let those fires warm us and light the way. And we gotta learn from conservative funders and movements, like everything. They've been doing some very effective things. Like I say, you know, fund multi-year and we think maybe three or four years or something. Conservative funders fund like 20 to 30 years or more at a time. And they get out of this bullshit like overhead and stuff it's like, oh, you wanna spend all this money? Go ahead, we don't care as long as you're advancing these things that we care about. This is what we should be doing. And they are not afraid to invest money because they know that if they invest money now, it will save so much money later on. Like we are spending so much money undoing a whole bunch of stuff. If we had spent more money in the past, we would have to spend so much money now undoing shit. Okay, so like we gotta learn from them and just do some of the stuff that they're doing but with different values. Examine, accept, and mitigate for our own complicity in advancing injustice. I was talking to, I think it was Bao, and Giles last night, and they were like, oh yeah, we, you know, we've been ranting about some of this stuff for years now. But then, what changed just happened? And we gotta start thinking about why things don't happen. I remember, this is telling me I got five minutes left, I'm sorry. I remember just having a conversation with a bunch of funders in Seattle, and I said, hey, we've been saying these things for a long time now. What, why haven't things changed? And one program officer raised her hand and said, you know, probably because like, we have really cushy jobs. Mm. Yes. And we don't wanna rock the boat. And I will always remember that moment because that was like a moment of pure honesty that I think all of us need to grapple with. That our livelihoods depend on the existence of inequity so that we can be paid to fight it. And until we acknowledge that, nothing will change. We, there, it's gonna be hard to change things. Sorry, I had to add this slide twice because it's so important. 
All right, here's a summary. Own our power and awesomeness. Embrace and flinch look the past. Have the courage and imagination. Remember Juicero. Get over archaic <laughs> bullshit. Give multi year general operating dollars, my God. <laughs> Angelize less. Mobilize and act more. Have the courage to be unfair. Move funding to marginalized communities. Reimagine the roles of funders. Move the levers of power. Unapologetically engage with politics. Burn a few bridges. Learn from the fundamental movement and examine, accept, mitigate for our own stuff. Thank you. I'm going to pose here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm going to pose like here in case you want to take a picture of me and this like list of things. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm almost done. I was talking to Michelle Coffey yesterday. He, she was mentioning the decline. Yeah, Michelle! <laughs> the decline and the emergence, which I really love. And I was like, I can see the decline. Okay, <laughs> like things are declining. What's the emergence? And we got into this conversation where it's like, well, that is what's to be. Something is emerging from all of this. And it's exciting and scary. And I asked Michelle, like, are you optimistic that, that like, whatever is going to emerge is going to be good for our society? And she said, well, that's what we need to do. We've got to make sure, <laughs> right? We are in charge of what emerges. This is what we got to do. This is our job moving forward. We got to figure out what emerges, and we ensure that it's going to be an awesome, kick-ass, inclusive, just community. That's what we got to do, because we are Jedi unicorns. <laughs> yeah. This is the last thing I'm going to say, because I have two minutes left. People are like, Vu, what's with you and the, the unicorns? You know, like, why, why are you so obsessed with unicorns? I'll tell you a quick story. I got my master's in social work, and then no one would hire me because I had no uh, experience. <laughs> so I, I got into this freelance writing gig where I was working for a company called Bella Sarah. They made um, card games aimed at girls age 5 to 12. And you buy these cards, and they have unicorns on them and a code, and you take these unicorns, you go to this website, this virtual world, and you put in the code, and it unlocks a unicorn that you take around, and you, you, you like teach other unicorns about love and community and belonging, and you grow things in your unicorn garden. <laughs> and I wrote the dialogue for these unicorns. <laughs> I would write things like, hey, sparkle wing. <laughs> Would you grow me a moonflower? <laughs> and the company tanked within six months after I was hired. <laughs> but it made me realize that we are the unicorns we seek. You are unicorns. You're out there making art and making the world better and teaching people about love and belonging and friendship and using art to like fight injustice. That's what you do every single day. Every single day. But because it's like air, you know, the work is not appreciated and oftentimes not seen. But I just want to let you know that you are amazing, you are awesome, and you are nonprofit AF. Thank you. One more time for that amazing talk. I'm a millennial, so everything's on my iPhone. Um, hmm. So you, my first question, oh, first of all, we're gonna be doing some Q&A for the next 19 minutes and 28 seconds. So please be thinking about your questions and there will be mic runners coming around in a moment. Um, you never told us which baby animal <laughs> could kill you. <laughs> Who knows the, the answer to that question? The llama? There was no, no. There was no llama. There was no llama. It was the blue ring octopus, y'all. Okay. It has enough venom to kill 20 adults. Powerful. Well, yeah. I mean, I, if we think about this. I mean, I threw the octopus on there because we've been cute baby animals for a long time. And maybe it's time for us to use a little bit more venom. Amen. And then I, you were talking about why, how we need to be engaged in politics, and I couldn't help but think that, you know, what a entertaining, passionate, poignant, brilliant, 
stump speech you just gave, have you ever thought about running for office? Um, I feel like my role is to support people who are running for office, right? And I do think that we do need more, more women of color running. So I think that's where I would put all of my energy in supporting women of color running. Amen, amen. So was that enough, was that enough banter? Is there, are there some questions out here in the audience? Can I get a hand raise from the mic runners? Okay, can you come up to the front so everyone can see you, please? Does anyone have a question out there yet? Amazing, right second row, right here. And if you could stand if you're able, that might be able to be helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. You're awesome too. Um, how do we get board members to be on board with all of this revolutionary ideas? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate this. I know there's a lot of power issues with board members on foundations and just across the sector in general. And I think that we really need to have some sort of revolution when it comes to board members and who's in power, right? Because right now our sector is, all the most powerful people are wealthy white men who are trustees of, of foundations. And I think we can keep trying to get them to understand and, you know, I. I we can keep pushing and delivering the same messages and having different people, and that, that works in some ways. But I do think that we need to like really reconsider the whole structure of, of it all. For example, I, I really like family foundations. I don't think they, like that makes no sense. Like why, why are these family members the only, the only board members? I don't, I don't get it. So I think in some ways it's not about like getting them to change, it's like how do we actually get different voices there to balance things out and maybe transition some of the older board members out of this whole thing. Um, yeah, so. I'm just, I'm just building on that a little bit. Are, yeah. there, are there specific examples of kind of new forms of philanthropy or resource mobilization that you, that inspire you? Um, that might be new models since, you know, I think there's a really strong argument that we just need new models, right? Um, well, I mean, the best model is people paying their fair share of taxes, and government does its work, and it's functional, right? So we need to be pushing for that. Like, we need to push for representative governments and for tax uh, laws that are fair. Um, in the meanwhile, though, yeah, there, there are certain things we could be doing. We should be supporting mutual assistance organizations. We should be supporting direct cash transfers to people. I, I appreciate the conversation about, like, funding individual artists that Ambitious and CCI and other groups have been doing, right, because like, why? Like this is what conservatives have been doing so effectively, right? Even if you're like a horrible person who like murdered protesters, you probably get a book deal because the conservative movement will rally around you. They're not like, oh, sorry, Kyle Rittenhouse, like we're, you're not, you're an individual, we're not gonna support you. We're gonna wait until you join an organization or something. Like this is, what, this is one of the things that we need to learn is like we should be trying different models and it can't just be the nonprofit. I love nonprofits, right? But we need to fund individuals, we need to fund movements, we gotta fund co-ops and other things too. Absolutely. All right, so I see a question in sort of aisle three right here. No, 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 it would be please great use, to the, use mic. the mic for folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi, so first of all, I, you have a lot of uh, fan people here, me being one of them, so thank you for being here. Um, can you speak a little bit about the power of collaboration as we're talking about undoing, you know, where we stand right now as funders um, and, and what collaborative work can do with kind of moving that initiative forward? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is really necessary. We've had this nonprofit Hunger Games that we've been playing with one another, right? Because of this myth of scarcity that there's only so much money to go around when there's tons of money. There's like over $1.7 trillion or 1.4 or something. Trillion dollars just sitting there in endowments and donor advice funds. So this myth of scarcity is just that. It is a myth. But we've been perpetuating it so much that it's like forced everyone to play this Hunger Games here. And when you're in the hu Hunger Games, Oftentimes, you just, you don't naturally collaborate when you should be. So we gotta figure out how to stop doing that. And then the collaboration needs to look differently too. 
I feel like we've been having very superficial collaborations, like, oh, I'll write a letter of support for you, you know, like for this grant, and we think that's collaboration. Um, my last organization, RVC, you know, we were founded because we, we were trying to get more leaders of color into the sector and get, get organizations led by communities of color to, to work together uh, more effectively and to collaborate. And one of the best things that we did was like became this umbrella organization where we just became the fiscal sponsors of organizations and then we just took over the finances and everything and taxes and all and HR and then these organizations can just focus on doing what they're good at and what they like. And that has been really amazing. It's kind of like the Star Trek model. We're gonna talk about the future. We should learn from the Starfleet model. <laughs> because right now what is happening is like we have all these, these captains, right, of starships and they each have their own mission and so on. Right, but they're like, but they, they have Starfleet to help coordinate so that Picard is not like chasing after receipts and stuff, right? <laughs> Spending 50% of his time just chasing after receipts. So this is what we need to be doing. Like we need more like Starfleet type models here so that the organization can focus on what they're good at. And, but we gotta break up through some barriers. Like we have this teach our person to fish mentality where it's like, oh, you gotta learn fish, uh, like HR fishing and finance fishing and tax fishing. These are carpenters, y'all. Like, why are we forcing them to teach, to learn how to fish? And then we whine about, like, not enough houses being built. Mm -hmm. Like, just give them a fish. Let them do carpentry. I know, you know, that's... The, met the metaphors are out of control today. <laughs> like, wow, okay. Starfleet. I'm here yeah. for it, though. Oh, perfect. This section is really lit. Um, <laughs> and then there's one in the back. Then there's a question in the back behind the camera after after you speak. How's your name? Um, we know each other, but this is not Amber, a plant question. Amber, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so I wanted to kind of rewind to probably the most uncomfortable slide, because that's where I was put, um, around um, your anecdote around, you know, someone admitting that in philanthropy we have the cushy jobs. and. Part of our complicity is in keeping those jobs. So where do you think that kind of nexus is between trying to be in an organization and do some good and trying to you know, use your influence within that organization to right the ship versus where you just gotta say, I can't be a part of this, I gotta go. Yeah, thanks Amber. Um, my friend Andrea Arenas, who was a program officer at a couple of foundations in Seattle calls it the, the golden handcuff of philanthropy, mm -hmm. right? Which is that, yeah, these jobs can be, they can, they can pay more than other in, in, the, in the sector. And we all have family members to support. We're trying to survive. So yeah, it can, it can be very hard to challenge things and, and to push things. Um, but I feel like there hasn't even been much of a, an acknowledgement of it. Right, like because it's so uncomfortable that we are in denial about it. So we don't even admit that, yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna say this thing not because I don't want to, but because I can't afford to lose my job. And, but the reality is that lots of people have been, have been challenging and getting flack, and it has been women of color who have been pushing and losing their jobs. And so, So what I would say is like those of us who have more privilege, those of us who are men or who are white or able-bodied, neurotypical, like we need to step it up now, right? We gotta use our privilege and start pushing back because other people have, women of color have, and they've been losing their jobs and we need to come in and, you know, come join the, in, into the fight, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is of course happening um, not just in our sector, but in academia and, um, you know, all over the place and people speaking up. Especially around, you know, the Israel, you know, Israel's. Yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm, in, I'm, I think I'm enacting what I'm talking about even in this moment. Um, Israel's genocide of the Palestinian people, um, and I think that there's there's something about. Um, I think this question of risk, right, is something that is, is something that we're chewing on and, and talking about, and I and I'm thinking of something that Ashley Woodard Henderson um, from the Highlander Center told me, which was, you know, you're on assignment, you know, from movement in philanthropy to move resources to the movement for, for black liberation, you know? So I think if we, if, we, if we can transform the way we're thinking about, 
who, who, are, who we're accountable to, right? Um, from our institutions, um, primarily to the, to, the, to the communities we serve, I think, it makes, I think it makes that decision about risk so much clearer. It might not be easy, right, um, to, to stand on the right side of history, but it makes, it makes the, I think it makes, um, it makes the stakes of the choice that, that much clearer. So that's just my two cents, if you care. Um, Thank you, Robert. Yeah. And then there's a question in the back. If you could talk a little bit about how you see intermediaries playing a role in this conversation, specifically given that they don't have funding of their own to, to play the same part that you're talking about. Um, so just wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, I love intermediaries. And uh, well, a lot of support for intermediaries, yeah. I love them because, you know, Starfleet is an intermediary, <laughs> right? Very that. Exactly, but I, I think about not just Starfleet, but I think about like mushrooms. I think about. <laughs> I, knew I, think, were, I knew you were going to take it there. Actually. <laughs> right? No, no. I think about like the mycelium, right? We think about the mushrooms, but we don't think about the mycelium that makes it possible for that. The mycelium is like this, like the roots of the mushrooms, and all these mushrooms are out there. So I think about the nonprofits that are out there as like the mushrooms we see and eat. Um, these are nonprofits. They nourish our communities. But the intermediaries are like the mycelium. They bring resources. They cleanse the soil. They facilitate communication. I wrote a whole blog post on this. It's very nerdy. Um, so, but I think that because mycelium is invisible, no one really appreciates it again. Right? But it's absolutely vital. And we need more. We need to support intermediary organizations. We especially need to support intermediary organizations led by marginalized community members. Yeah. Amen. And for those of you who can't see, um, there are there are lots of multicolored mushrooms on Vu's socks right now. So he's really committed <laughs> to the mushroom game. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, of course, Roberto, right in the front. Right. We'll take this home. <laughs> and Roberto. No, I said no, we're no, out of time, no. okay? So I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah. I love you. Well, where's the you, you changed? You. you were wearing shorts today. I changed for you, baby. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you didn't need to. Uh, no, I'm really curious. You're a great writer, and I really appreciate it. But can you just riff a loop on public funders and how they are loop, they're different than private founders and public funders that are government agencies and your insights into how that how that operations, how, how that works. Just curious. Ah, thank you, Robert, for the uh, softball question at the end here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate you all. I don't know, actually, I mean, I don't talk much about public funder, but I, I, I should. It's on my list of things to talk about. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I mean, it's it's there's so there's a lot of good things like I, I I I do want to end by saying that I do appreciate funders of all different kinds because you all do incredible work, moving resources to communities that really need it. There's tons of things we could all be doing better, right? So whatever types of funders there are, yeah, I mean these are similar things. Like why is there wealth uh, hoarding of resources? Why are we not focusing on taxes? Um, but funder with like public funders. We do need to like talk more about this because right now there has been, I don't know, they seem untouchable and they've been doing a whole bunch of just terrible stuff sometimes. Um, they do some good stuff too, but like I remember just like the, the bureaucracy and everything and we just assume like, sorry, they're a public funder. We can't actually criticize them. We can't say that they should be doing this because it's, it's public money and because it's public money, we have more of a legitimacy to <laughs> criticize it. Right? There should be more funding from government for the arts and everything. Like, we shouldn't have to scramble for funding every year. Artists shouldn't have to scramble. Like, the government should be, should be funding this. So, you know what, I'm going to calm down because my blood pressure is, <laughs> is, is a lot. So, thank you, Roberto, for the, the question. I, I also have high blood pressure. Um, yeah. So, we'll talk about me our meds later, maybe. Um, could, you, could you send us out? On a, on, a, on a hopeful note, I'm thinking about Miriam Kaba's quote. 
Um, you know, hope is a discipline. <laughs> we have to practice it every day. That's yeah. something that I've been saying to myself, you know, every day um, since the war started. And I wonder if there's, um, in the spirit of how awesome we are, how we become more awesomer, <laughs> can you send us home with, with a hopeful note? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Robert. I, I appreciate um, this. You know, I, I criticize our sector a lot, but it's because I really love our sector. Like, this is, it, it's, it's amazing. And sometimes I talk about my childhood and how I got to from Vietnam here. Like, my father fought against um, the North, and he was put into re-education camp. And my family escaped and came over here. And we, we had lost everything. And I think the worst part, though, was losing your sense of community. And I don't know, it was, it was, very, it was very challenging. Um, and it was all these nonprofits that came in that helped, that helped my family, right? And behind those nonprofits are funders like you. And they brought us food and warm, and warm clothing. They helped my brothers and me to register in school. And, but I think what the, the thing that did, that was most important was they restored this sense of hope and community that we never thought we would ever feel again. And that's what you do every single day. You know, like that's what the folks in this room do every day. And so I'm, I'm really thankful. Like I don't know the organizations that helped me and my family or the funders that helped them and all this stuff. And so I can't go back to Philly and, and thank them and let them know that because of what they did for me and my family and restoring hope and community for us, that it led me to getting my master's in social work and so I could pay it forward. So I think that in, in many ways, the work that you're doing is like throwing a rock into a lake at night, right? You just, you may never see the ripples, but that's what you do, the ripples are there. I'm like one of these ripples. And so, because I can't thank these nonprofits and the funders, you know, I just want to leave by thanking you because your work matters. It's creating ripples that you may never see, but the ripples are definitely out there. Thank you so much, Drew. Yeah. And thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you.